Good morning. It's Mrs. Sullinger again. This is going to be the uh, recorded version of the Upper Airway PowerPoint. Um, hope everybody's doing well. You guys are all getting involved in the Kahoot Challenge and the, um, and the Flipgrid, which is great, great tools to interact when you, um, when you can't be there in person. So I'm going to go over the PowerPoint. Um, yes, I know it says spring 2019, uh, but things haven't really changed in a year. Um, we're going to review the objectives. These are found on the um, week nine uh, page. So respiratory rates for various ages. This is a good chart to keep, showing you how the respiratory rate actually um, trends down as you get older, but it also has your pulse and your blood pressure. So uh, good, good handy reference for you. So we want to look at some differences in infants and children and kind of compare the respiratory system and anatomy to adults because we deal with children a little bit differently than we do with adults based on their anatomy and physiology. So the ribs in a child are pretty much cartilage and very flexible. So there's a lot of um, movement and therefore the muscles are kind of weak and in and if so, if children are less than six, generally speaking, um, they're dependent on the diaphragm, and so you get an abdominal breathing. So in adults, we really don't want to see abdominal breathing. That's not a great, a great thing. But for children, that's almost expected. And you can see where the muscles are. Um, this is also a good picture if you're talking about retractions, so intercostal. Um, on the right hand side, there's a, an arrow pointing or a line pointing to the intercostals. So that's where you would see intercostal retractions. And then if you go down, um, if you were below the rib cage, that would be subcostal. You also have a very good picture of the sternum in the middle. So suprasternal would be above the, the sternum and uh, substernal would be below the sternum. And you can have different types of retractions at the same time. Breath sounds, differences, children have a very thin chest wall. Um, so oftentimes, and I think some of you have found this in clinical with the um, RSV babies that we've taken care of, that you can hear um, breath sounds um, from one side, one lung, one lobe, over the entire chest. You can also have referred upper airway noise that comes through as well. Um, so try to listen with a smaller stethoscope and listen at the apices and the mid-axillary areas to get some of those other parts of the, the lung sounds. Infants and toddlers um, don't usually have the vesicular sounds. Um, you can go back and look up the bronchial and vesicular sounds. I can't do a very good um, imitation. Let me see if my um, link will work here for you. Oh, nice.
so you can um, again look at that on your on your own um, and go back to my my screen here that I'm sharing oops here we go that one okay so um, those are the different um, breast sounds the manubrium is that top part of the sternum so differences in the pattern so infants um, I know students have told me they've had difficulty checking the pulse because the heart goes so fast but sometimes when children are breathing um, very quickly it's difficult to count those as well um, children also have short periods of what might be considered apnea where they um, they breathe in irregular patterns but that's sort of normal for them um, so they'll take a couple breaths and then there won't be a breath for a while and then they'll just start breathing again normally when like for example when my husband's sleeping and he you know he'll breathe a couple times and then he'll stop breathing and, you, and you, you're waiting and waiting and then there's this big <gasps> when they start breathing again right because they weren't breathing but in infants there isn't that big that big inhalation it's just a regular part of the breathing pattern so when you do notice apnea, um, the things that you need to look for are the time and duration. Apnea is usually defined as, as uh, not breathing for greater than 20 seconds. Look if there's any color change, um, circumoral cyanosis or a, or a um, cyanosis or, uh, anywhere in the body. Um, generally, it would be the face first. Um, if the heart rate decreases at that time, if the O2 saturation decreases with that, how low the O2 saturation goes, and then what action stimulated the breathing? Did you as the nurse have to do something to get the child to start breathing again? Um, did you have to sort of, you know, um, stimulate them a little bit? Did you have to apply oxygen? What, what did you have to do? Or was the infant able to what's called self-recover? Uh, and able to start breathing again on their own. So, but those are the um, the key points that you need to doc. You would be documenting that in your in your charting. So, sleep apnea um, in adults: the tongue, soft palate, fall back, obstruct the airway. Um, oftentimes, can be um, caused by obesity. Usually, you can get an ENT consult. You'll end up with CPAP. In children, um, we are seeing a, a larger number of um, children that are obese, but there can also be enlarged adenoids. So that's something to, to keep in mind. Again, that would be an ENT consultation. They, they might do a tonsillectomy and an adenoidectomy. Um, and then again, diet, exercise, trying to, to stay fit. So there's something that we used to call an ALTE, now we call it a BRUE, um, and ALTE is an apparent life-threatening event. It was felt that that was too sort of scary and didn't really um, explain what the event was, but this is often seen um, when the infant has gone home, and there's usually some episode of apnea, choking, or gagging, um, in a near-term or term infant, so an infant that's greater than 70, uh, 37 weeks gestation, generally seen two weeks to two months, often, often associated with feeding, but generally speaking, 50% of the time, half the time, there's no identifiable, identifiable cause. The one key thing is that it generally requires CPR um, to, to kind of resuscitate the child or some kind of big intervention, um, which then... Um, brings the child into the hospital for evaluation and monitoring. So we usually do like a 24-hour observation. They're on um, cardiac respiratory monitor. Um, oftentimes the nurse is at the bedside or in the same room, um, or we teach the parent what to look for. Uh, oftentimes the story is, well, I was feeding, I was feeding my baby, or they were having a bottle, or I just fed them, and then they started choking, or they just stopped breathing and turned blue. Um, and then they they passed out, and I had to do some rescue breathing. We called nine one one, something like that, is the story that you will get. Um, sudden infant death syndrome SIDS. Um, oh, I'm sorry, uh, I didn't go back and tell you what the B R U E is. Brewy is a brief, resolved, unexplained event. So that is felt that it's a better understanding of what actually happened. So it's a brief 
So it was short acting. So the child started choking or suddenly turned blue. It's resolved because there was an outcome. You're able to revive the child and we, um, unexplained because we can't really tell you why it happened. And then it, it was an event. So sudden infant death syndrome, SIDS, uh, sudden death of an infant less than a year of age, um, still unexplained, although if you do some research, there are some now different um, different studies coming out of, of why this happens. Generally speaking, you don't see the child. It's, it's you put the child in the crib, and then you come back in, and unfortunately, the child has passed away, is dead. Uh, it is the leading cause of infant mortality. Uh, infant being greater than 30 days, congenital anomalies um, are the other number one cause. Um, I have, in my experience, we had, when I was at CHOMP, we had one, two, I think three SIDS babies come in within a two or three month time frame. And when those babies come into the ER, the NICU nurse is called down to help with the resuscitation. And um, so it's, it's pretty scary. Generally speaking, the child, the infant is uh, dead on arrival. It's very difficult to uh, revive the children because oftentimes they've been dead for a while. Um, and so we do everything we can. We make sure um, that if the family wants to watch the, the resuscitation that they're there. But I think the big part of that is the support for the family because oftentimes we as as the care providers, we're in, in the emergency room, we're right hands on with the infant and the parent family is out in the hallway and they're distraught, they're beside themselves. And so I think it's really important for someone, the charge nurse, somebody to call social services, call chaplain, somebody um, to be there and sit with the family, with the mom um, while all this is going on and, and to make sure that the family has support. So the research is showing um, um, developmental age, environmental stress, the smoking, smoke in the house. Um, there's really not any anywhere that um, that points to one specific cause, not related to immunizations. Um, many of these happen well, probably after the two month immunizations, but between two and six months is is the peak. And then um, it's different than an apneic episode where you had the choking. This is, um, they, they just stop breathing. Um, and sometimes I guess it could be related to abuse or homicide, which is really, really, really scary to think about. Um, two to four months. Okay, I lied. I said two to six, two to four. Um, generally speaking, a male, although I have seen some females, winter months, the smoke, um, and this is where the back to sleep campaign comes into play with the prone or side. We, we don't do prone or sideline. You do supine, um, back to sleep. Don't share beds. Um, take all the bedding, the quilt, the quilts, the bedspreads, pillows, anything out of the crib, um, and try not to overheat or have too many blankets. Uh, we just talked about the back to sleep campaign. I think you guys are probably all familiar with that. Um, pacifier use has been shown to decrease SIDS in some studies. So now we're going to look at upper respiratory tract differences again. So the airways are shorter and narrower than the adult. And if you're looking at the um, infant airway is four millimeters in diameter and the adult airway is 20 millimeters. So the top is the newborn, the bottom is the adult. You can see how um, delicate the airway actually is. And so if you had one meter, millimeter of swelling, that would pretty much take up a bigger, a larger percentage of the airway. Whereas in an adult, if you had a one millimeter um, amount of swelling, you still have a good size airway left to move air through. So here's our um, talk about retractions. So increase effort to move the air um, you have increased effort to move the air through the airway because the airway is swollen and blocked that the lungs are really trying to 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 get the air and so you get the retractions are seen so here's a, another picture um, you can have the suprasternal you can have supra clavicular so supra is above sub is below and there's your intercostal substernal subcostal retractions. You can also get something called a tracheal tug, which is up um, above the suprasternal. 
where um, kind of like the airway, the neck part kind of goes indents in as well. And if you see that, that's that's really bad. The, the infant works really, really hard. And if the infant is working that hard to breathe without oxygen, without high flow, um, what can happen is that the infant is working so hard and then finally they've worked so hard that they can't work anymore. And so then that's when you run into trouble. So these are things you want to tell parents um, to be looking to be looking for. Because if you're seeing retractions, they need to be, be coming to the ER or see the doctor. Um, so when you're looking at newborn respiratory distress, you have um, different types of um, uh, the accessory things that show you that the newborn is in distress and a newborn would be birth to 28 days and one of um, grunting is asterisk if you hear the, the grunting it's kind of like a strider um, they're really tugging and and um, and pulling they're trying to um, actually give themselves positive end expiratory pressure on their own so they're kind of like uh, uh, trying to, to to keep the alveoli open Nasal flaring is never a good thing. Um, the retractions, and if the child is head bobbing, that's their version of tracheal tug. And so the head actually is moving uh, because they're trying to expand their lungs so much. And so the head is moving with them. So if you see, if you hear the grunting, if you see the head bobbing, then then th those are that's bad. You don't want to see head bobbing. So different colors that you might see, um, model, that's a top picture, um, and it's not necessarily as evident in a child. Sometimes it can be very, um, like, delicate, like, it's, it can be difficult to see sometimes. You can get the circumoral cyanosis, which is around the lips. Uh, central cyanosis would be a very late sign of distress, um, and you, so you don't want the tongue or the oral mucosa um, to be dark or the face to be to, to have a color change that's that's not good. Um, Alter level of um, consciousness so decreasing saturations they can be um, have worked so hard that they're very tired. Um, they could also be very restless and irritable. Um, this is also for the older kids they might have a decreased awareness of their surroundings so we'll talk about a couple different um, upper airway conditions and and you'll see where this will occur so restlessness um tachypnea tachycardia tachycardia i'm sorry tachypnea and tachycardia um decreased air exchange um sweating diaphoresis hypertension low oxygen saturation levels. Um, you you kind of want to keep a child above 94% on room air. So anything that's lower than 90% is, um, or a uh, trend downward is not good. So this is a picture of the upper respiratory tract. Uh, this is what we're gonna talk about in, in this particular PowerPoint. Um, and so you've got the nose, the sinuses, the tonsils, nasopharynx, oropharynx, the epiglottis. We will talk about the epiglottis. That's pretty important. Um, the laryngopharynx, and then there's your esophagus and the trachea. So remember, we have both airway and um, nutrition, digestion in, in there. So again, comparing a child to an adult, you can see the size differences, how much airway is there. Um, the oral cavity is smaller. Um, you guys can look, look through the, the differences. I think this is a good, um, a good schematic that shows you the differences. And the child's airway is, is more compacted as well. So it's almost a little bit easier for them to to um, like, for example, if you're sleeping and you, you occlude your airway, there's less airway in a child. So generally when there's a code, by the way, um, when you think cardiac arrest, that's an adult. If there's a child that collapses, it's generally a respiratory issue. You're not generally seeing a cardiac issue um, in, a young, in a young child. It's generally a respiratory issue, which is why maintaining the airway and oxygenation is the number one priority not necessarily getting the pads on and delivering the shock and doing CPR with kids, especially neonates, airway, airway, airway. So there can be different um, viral respiratory conditions. 
um, way more than 100 viruses cause the common cold. Um, you get it, the inflammation, edema, the, um, mucus, we're, we're all experiencing that. When you're looking at um, causes and risk factors, again, the age, the climate, um, there's an exercise that you're going to be doing an assignment talking about um, RSV, respiratory syncytial virus trends, and take a look at Florida. You know, what's the difference between the Florida region and the California region in terms of the length of the season? Um, are there other family members that are sick? And right now, we're all sheltered in place. So that's supposed to be safe. But then I keep thinking, but what if somebody has a cold um, and we're all exposed in the house together? So hand washing, hand washing. Um, immunization status, if somebody's um, more Im immune compromised, smoking, um, does the child smoke? Are there any um, exposures? Those types of things can lead to some upper respiratory tract conditions. So you want to look at a cough when the parent says, well, they've had a cough. We've heard this in report, right? The child presented with a cough and fever times three days. And so what kind of cough? When did it start? How long has it been going on? Is there any pain? Um, we'll be talking about like a croupy cough or whooping cough, which is pertussis. Um, and those children are at risk because they cough so hard they stop breathing. Does it happen during the day? Does it happen at night? And then what do the um, secretions look like? Different tests you can do. You can do the nasopharyngeal swabs. Those are always fun to do on children. Um, you take the little, um, like it's like a cotton tip applicator, and you have to go up in the nose and um, swab it around. Uh, you can do, there's rapid, um, the throat cultures, like a rapid strep that you can do. Um, the flu and the RSV come back pretty quickly. The pertussis takes a while. You can also do different CTs to rule, or x-rays to rule out pneumonia, um, looking at pulse oximetry, any blood tests that you can do, blood cultures for infections, skin testing for allergies, and then um, pulmonary function testing is, a, is another thing. So this is the nasopharyngeal swab, and that's, yeah, try to get the child positioned um, safely so that you're not poking, or, you know, anything. Maybe the parent can help hold, but you really do, you can't just be in the nares. You have to go, be going all the way back into the nasopharynx. And then there in the throat, you can see a swollen tonsil, and then um, you try to get back as far as you can, and again, you're rotating um, the, the swab. Uh, complications that you can see when it is a cold, not a cold, upper respiratory versus flu versus allergies. A lot of diseases, communicable diseases begin as a cold. Um, you know, is there conjunctivitis or the eyes, um, the conjuncti conjunctiva red? Um, maybe sometimes there's um, uh, an earache, an otitis or sinusitis. And then um, we're going to talk about the bronchitis and pneumonia that's in the lower airway. So when you're talking about the cold, what the picture shows, they call that the um, allergic salute because they're, um, that's always when you have allergies. You see kids doing that, pushing their nose up all the time to get the, um, the drainage away, to wipe the drainage away. Although now I guess we're doing it on our sleeves or into Kleenex. So um, nasal drainage, um, itchy nose, sneezing, dark circles often under the eyes, um, pale pink mucosa. So that's that's allergies. There's some there's the dark circles under the eyes on the left hand picture in the um, edema seen on the right hand picture. There's some mucus there as well. Um, conjunctiv conjunctivitis. There we go. Conjunctivitis. So burning versus itching. Um, the drainage. Is it a watery discharge? Is it like the the white kind of discharge? Are the eyes? Um, shut when like when the child wakes up in the morning and you can't get the eye open because there's so much crusty um drainage there are the sclera pink or red um eye pain that type of thing you can do eye ointment eye drops for um bacterial comfort measures if it's viral um as well as um, um as well as antihistamine eye drops um, which might be better than po because they're they're um going into the eye itself so on the 
think you can guess this, but on the left side of the screen is the allergic reaction, and on the right side of the screen is the bacterial conjunctivitis. So the eyelashes are, are moist because there's a lot of drainage. They probably had to get the eye open. The drainage can be this kind of whitish color. It can be yellow. It can be green, all of the above. So looking at the tympanic membrane, um, we don't necessarily teach you how to do this. So if we're on the, um, when you guys are on the pediatric floor, I don't think I did this with my group, I apologize. Um, if we can find the um, otoscope, let's practice looking at each other's eardrums. Um, I'll have to find, there's one in skills lab, I just need to remember where it is. But as you can see, the, the picture, go back to your anatomy, the external, middle, and inner ear. Um, on the left-hand side, remember within the child, the eustachian tube is um, a little bit flatter, um, so that bacteria tends to sit instead of drain. And then if you look on the right-hand side, that would be um, the landmarks in the tympanic membrane. It's really hard. I'm not very good at identifying um, the tympan. I mean, I can find the tympanic membrane, but if there's fluid, um, I have a hard time remembering what everything's called and what it looks like. So here's that eustachian tube again. The infant's child's being flatter um, than the adults, and so anything also that goes in the nose can get back up into the ear, or anything that comes in through the ear, you know, they can get stuck. In adults, things just kind of drain. Um, acute otitis. So earaches, um, the bulging tympanic membrane, usually a yellowish green, um, purulent foul smelling drainage. And so here's some pictures. There's a red bulging membrane, usually you do uh, antibiotics. And then um, the bottom picture actually shows uh, an ear tube. If you've ever wanted to see what an ear tube looks like, the um, color, I believe, is related. I'm sure somebody will correct me. Um, but the color is related to the size of the tube they come in, or the manufacturer they come, because they come in different sizes. And what happens is, is as the child gets, um, gets bigger and, and is growing, the um, ear, the me membrane gets larger and the tubes will fall out. And so often there's multiple surgeries to reinsert. Uh, ear tubes. And then there's otitis media with an effusion. So um, a lot of times there's ringing, popping sounds, could be potentially um, hearing loss, balance can be off because there's a lot of, lot of fluid in there. Um, and then here's just some more pictures for your edification on what the tympanic membrane looks like, normal, bulging, um, the uh, fluid, air and fluid bubbles in the um, in C, and then D is actually a retracted membrane where it's kind of suck, sucked in, and that's very painful. So influenza, um, onset of high fever, they look tired, headachey, the dry hacking cough, sore throat, muscle aches. So we can use Tamiflu. We actually um, had that in um, our pediatric rotation, but it has to be given within 48 hours of onset of symptoms. So sometimes that's difficult to, um, to, to figure out when that was, or the child's already had three to five days of these symptoms, and so then Tamiflu um, doesn't prevent it, but can help decrease um, the severity of the symptoms. Um, viral versus strep throat. So there's your associated viral symptoms, strep throat, how to tell the, the difference. You can do that rapid strep test. And in strep, the fever, one of the key things would be the fever is greater than 101, and you can get the um, petechiae on the soft palate, the, the lymphadenopathy. So there's a picture of strep throat. Um, the thing in the middle would be the uvula. So you get the tongue and the uvula. The uvula's kind of deviated or stuck because all the mucus and the, um, those white spots, that's what's indicative. Um, those are the tonsils and um, the white spots are what's indicative of the strep infection. And because we're talking strep here, that's why um, on the page for the day, we talk about um, rheumatic fever um, and scarlet fever, the differences of that, because those happen as a result of strep A infection. 
So strep throat, group A, beta hemolytic strep. So you're going to do the throat culture. Generally, it's a rapid um, treating with amoxicillin, generally speaking. The gargle with salt, warm salt water is really good. Lots of hydration. Um, can use uh, Tylenol, depending on the age of the child, or um, ibuprofen. And then um, remembering your cephalosporins. So just a, a recall there for your cephalosporins and the generations. Um, complications. So here we talk about the scarlet fever versus the rheumatic fever. There is a link to the um, to the article. The article references the velveteen rabbit because that um, child had scarlet fever. So you can also end up with acute glomerulonephritis. And we will talk about that when we get to our um, elimination urinary tract uh, lecture. Um, it's not contagious after the first 24 hours of the antibiotic treatment. Um, and as always, the teaching point is complete the full course of the antibiotics. So here is um, scarlet fever, um, first day versus the third day of the rash. You get that kind of um, white strawberry looking tongue and then it turns to the red strawberry tongue. And that gives you an, an indication of all the symptoms that you would see with that. And then this is a child with, um, with that rash. That just looks painful. Child does not look like they're happy. Um, moving on, we can talk about mono. Remember we said mono, the kissing disease, um, is actually the Epstein-Barr virus, which is a human, um, the herpes virus 4. So cause, uh, things that you'll see are fever, fatigue, the sore throat, the swollen lymph nodes. There's a picture on the bottom there that shows you um, the lymph, the, the swelling. Um, usually the person's healthy. It'd be older children, young adults. Um, two to four weeks, and then a gradual recovery. I used to do um, a home, um, home tutoring um, when I was back in Ohio for the high school students, and I had one young lady uh, student who had mono, and I, I know I went for at least two months, maybe three, um, to do her tutoring. So there's um, rash, there's what you might see inside the mouth. Um, Tonsillectomies and adenoidectomies, not as common uh, as they used to be. So um, if they're less than three years, um, probably don't want to have that surgery done because um, the, the tissues can um, get smaller as a child gets older. Um, you don't want to do it during an acute, inf acute infection because um, if the tissue's inflamed, it's really difficult to remove all that and get all of it. And plus, you might spread the infection. Um, you would want to get labs, um, and you'll also get sort of that, I can't even do an example of it, but the sonorous snoring, um, because the airway's being blocked. And there's the, there's a little, um, picture that shows you where the adenoids are. So when is it indicated? So, and again, it, it can be the choice. It's up to the family and the physician working together to figure out what the best course of treatment is for the child. So the tonsillitis, recurrent sore throats, um, you know, watchful waiting is now the standard of care. Um, but if there have been um, less than seven, or I'm sorry, did you do that backwards? Yeah, less than seven in the past year, less than five in the past two, less than three in the past three, you're going to wait. Um, if there's with the adenoids, if the adenoids have gotten swollen um, and the nasal congestion is not improving and there's a lot of mouth breathing, taste and smell are impaired, um, if there's snoring, sleep apnea, persistent cough, chronic otitis, then, then you would probably um, go ahead and have the, um, the surgery done. Um, so, um, Post-op teaching, I'm sorry, hold on one second. I don't know why I did that. Um, previous, there we go. So post-op, oh, sorry, that's just, okay. So post-op nursing interventions. So when you're thinking of a child who, uh, say you're in PACU, and the child's come back from the tonsillectomy, what are, think to yourself here now, some things that you would be concerned about in terms of airway and breathing, and also in a post-op patient. So, 
one thing that you're going to be worried about is pain management because they've just had surgery. So um, Tylenol, again, depending on the age, ibuprofen, no aspirin. Um, and we don't usually use codeine anymore. We used to have meds uh, mixed with codeine, Tylenol with codeine, Tyco. Um, we used to use that all the time. And we don't do that anymore because why? What does codeine do to the respiratory system? It depresses it. And then the other thing that you're looking for is bleeding because you're probably going to have some bleeding generally in the first 24 hours post-op um, and perhaps later, seven to 10 days after surgery when things um, get, when things are starting to really heal. Um, and so you might see bleeding then. The back of the throat will look kind of white. There might be a kind of smell um, for a couple days. Um, up to maybe a week. Um, it's not an infection. It's an expected odor. Um, if anybody's had their um, theirs or kids' wisdom teeth pulled, it's kind of like that. Um, and then I would refer you to um, McKinney for caring for a child after um, tonsillectomy, adenoidectomy. So croup syndromes, um, like epiglottitis, so croup would be, these are upper air, airway illnesses um, from a swelling of the epiglottis and the larynx that extend um, to the trachea and the bronchi. So if you look on the right-hand side, you can see the epigl epiglottis and the, um, and the larynx. And so if there's swelling there, the air can't move through. Um, there can be viral or bacterial. So if it's a viral form, it's like a spasmodic laryngitis, or it could be what's called LTB, laryngeal tracheal bronchitis, or if it's bacterial, then it can be epiglot called epiglottitis. So epiglottitis is um, swelling of tissue above the vocal cords. So if you're thinking about trying to intubate somebody, um, I know my clinical group got to kind of play around with that a little bit. You were looking for the vocal cords um, in order to place the ET tube. Well, if there's swelling, it's very difficult to find that or to even get an airway in there, um, often caused by um, hemophilus influenza B, staph, strep. Um, you don't see it as much since we have the Hib vaccine now. Generally, three, four-year-olds, you see it. Um, a muffled voice um, is is present if it's the epiglottitis. And this is a medical emergency. So here's your little um, reminder, epiglottitis. They do that tripod position. They're kind of leaning forward because they, they can't breathe. They're really struggling to breathe. So the airways close, there's an increased pulse, there's restlessness, you see retractions, um, anxiety, the strider, and um, drooling. Drooling is one of the things and the tripod position, um, drooling especially, that will lend you to believe that it is um, an epiglottitis. Um, you don't examine the throat. You don't put um, this, the the um, you don't put anything in the mouth. Position them for comfort. Um, you want to have a tracheostomy tray available in case they need um, an airway, um, an artificial airway. Um, but it's it's definitely a medical emergency. If you would put um, the tongue depressor in the mouth or something to look at into the throat, um, it could spasm and cause them. Um, to have even more difficulty breathing. So um, you have the four Ds, the drooling, um, the dysphagia, because they can't swallow, um, distressed, and the um, dysphonia is it's like a croaking kind of sound is that you, um, that you hear along with the, um, the tripod position. Um, and, and usually it's an abrupt onset of fever. So no tongue blade, um, intubation and oxygen, antibiotics and IV fluids. But how do I know not to, not to, you know, put the tongue blade in to do an examination? Just don't, <laughs> just don't do that, especially if there's drooling. So the croup, um, three months generally to three years, you can see it up to age eight, um, usually in, in the younger kids, three, three to five years maybe, virus, allergies, um, this is the one where you run the warm shower bathroom, the, the water, um, the cool mist humidifier, or take the kid outside, and it will um, it will get better. Um, presume, assume the position of comfort, increase the fluids. Um, the croup is usually um, sudden onset at night, 
and it generally follows an upper respiratory infection. There's um, nasal discharge, laryngitis, there's that barking cough, um, you might have a red pharynx, maybe a mild fever, um, and it's the, um, the inspiratory strider with the barking cough. So different diagnostic tests, you can do x-rays, um, the steeple sign, which is what the two arrows in the picture, the x-ray on the right-hand side are showing you, indicating the um, symmetric subglottic narrowing. So you can, that's, it looks like a steeple. Um, and then the picture on the left shows you above the vocal cords, your um, thyroid cartilage, and then beneath the vocal cords where, um, where this will occur. And that's why you get the, the noises, because there's such a narrow airway. So acute, acute, acute croup collaboration, right? Respiratory stress. So this is where you would give um, dexamethasone, steroids. We also had examples of this. We got a report for our pediatric group. Um, I think it was dexamethasone um, to decrease the swelling, right? To help them breathe better. You can do um, albuterol. You can do pomocort. You can do racemic epi. Um, we don't always use that. It really kind of depends on how acute and how in distress the, the patient is. Um, so looking at types of sounds, the larynx, subglottic, and upper trachea, that's an inspiratory strider. And then if it's below the trachea, then it's an expiratory strider. That's where the, the problem is in the airway. So different medications that are used, antibiotics, um, steroids. You can also use like a Flonase for the nasal passages. Um, there's our adrenergic agonists, beta adrenergic agonists, the epi, the albuterol, um, Tylenol, NSAIDs. Um, not so much Vicodin and, and morphine anymore, only in, in dire circumstances. Um, you can also use the Singulair or antihistamines um, for allergies and then the Tamiflu uh, we talked about for the flu to help decrease those, those symptoms, the severity of those symptoms. Um, lots of combination products, um, things like uh, you can also use um, decongestants like a Sudafed, Afrin, but remember that if you're using those, those need to be short term because if you use them too long, you can get a rebound um, swelling and then you're back where you started from. And then some um, non-sedating or sedating, do you want um, diphenhydramine like Benadryl? Some, some children, they, it calms them down, it's very calming. Others, it has the opposite effect and they're running around the room like crazy. Um, and then the other ones are also, um, for, can be used for allergies, the antihistamines. And then, um, so something for talking afrin, neosinephrine, um, very potent, prompt, you know, like you, you put the nasal sprays in, oh, I can breathe, yay. Um, you can, because those are topical, right? But you can also take something like Sudafed that's oral, um, so it, the onset isn't quite as fast, but it lasts longer. And you don't get the rebound congestion. Um, Flonase um, turns off the cells involved in the inflammatory response. The stuffiness is relieved. Um, and then, but you have to think about the side effects that you get. Um, again, the rebound being, I think, the most. Um, and then what happens if you're using steroids? Then you have to think about the side effects that happen with steroid use. You have antitussives. Oh, this is all back to pharmacology. Yay. Um, suppress the cough. Like uh, Robitussin, again, we don't really use the, we don't use the codeine anymore. In fact, that's a prescription. Um, and there's also non-opioids that suppress um, by numbing the stretch receptors to prevent the cough reflex. Um, Tesselon pearls is a big thing. Um, I actually have that. <laughs> My son was so funny the other day. He's like, Mom, you're on benzos because he saw the benzonitate. And I said, uh, no, sweetie, it's not benzos. <laughs> it's benzonitate. It's, it's for my cough. It's Tesselon pearls. Um, and then the dextromethorphan, um, robitussin, um, worked really well for my kids. I just like Vicks VapoRub. Just rub that and I'm, I'm good. I love that. Um, over the counter cold products, um, should really only be used in older children over the age of four. Um, 
And then if, if the children are between four to six, hopefully with a prescri- hopefully they'll get prescription medications. It's really interesting the way parents read the labels. And so oftentimes you'll get for the over-the-counter medications, the child will have um, an overdose and then they end up in the ER. So do you always want to stop a cough? Maybe, maybe not, right? So there's your different um, options for the antitussives versus expectorants. So an expectorant um, thins the mucus, the guaifenesin, um, cool mist humidifiers. Like you want to get the stuff out. They need to cough it out. Um, and then that would be the end. So let me, oh, I'm back. Yay. So that is the end of um, the first uh, PowerPoint on upper airway. I will come back at you with the PowerPoint for the lower airway. Hope you're having a good day. See you in CRS.